if uh, you are visiting with us um, here at Big Valley Grace, uh, we're in a series called uh, Get a Grip, where we're looking at a number of the things that we need to get a grip on if we're going to you know, have the life that God wants us to have or live the life that God wants us to have. Last week, I, I shared with you what God said through the great prophet Jeremiah. He says, for I know the plans that I have for you, says the Lord. They are plans for good. God's plan for your life, for your family is, is good and not for disaster, to give you a future and a hope. But unfortunately, too many believers never experience this good plan. In fact, many believers would say their life is anything but good. In fact, it's more of a disaster. Some of you might be here you know, today and you're thinking, I don't know anything about that good plan. <laughs> My life's a disaster. My, my family's a disaster. My, my business is a disaster or whatever. And one of the great reasons that a lot of times people never experience this good life or that their life becomes a disaster is because they don't have a grip on their finances. And God's word has a lot to say about our finances. And some of you right now are going, man, this guy's like reading my mind. He's, he's got cameras in our living room, right? No, I don't have cameras in your living room. I just live in my own living room. I get it. I know. Unbelievable the tension and pressure that can come when you don't have a grip on your finances. So, so today we're going to talk about money or your wealth and how we can better get a grip on it. The Bible says this in 1 Timothy, For the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. And some people craving for money have wandered from the true faith and they've pierced themselves with many sorrows. Or maybe another way of putting it is they've uh, goofed up this good plan that God has for their lives. And you ought to underline those words or circle those words, love and craving, because they're, they're the, the key words. You see, a lot of people think that the Bible teaches that it's wrong to be wealthy or that it's wrong to have wealth or to you know, have money or whatever. They think the Bible says that money is the root of all evil, but that's not what the Bible teaches. God says it's, it's the love of money. And you all know what I'm talking about. It's the, it's the craving for money. That's what will get you into trouble. That's when all of a sudden the, this good plan that God has for your life and for your family or whatever starts to kind of go out the, the, the window. Having money, having wealth, that's not an issue. A lot of wealthy, wealthy people in the scriptures, a lot of wealthy people in the scriptures who love Jesus, God, very deeply. A lot of wealthy people here at Big Valley Grace who love Jesus very, very much. In fact, I want you to know, believe it or not, everybody in this room is wealthy according to the world's standards. The world's standards. If you own a car by the world's standards, you're wealthy. If you have more than one change of clothes in your closet, you're wealthy by the world standards. You take the whole globe. If you own a home, you're in the top 5% of the world in terms of wealth. By the world standards, just the very fact that you live in America means you're, you're, you're wealthy. Now, you shouldn't feel guilty about this, but as a follower of Jesus Christ, you do need to understand that before God, you have a responsibility to use your wealth, your money, your finances in a, a, a wise, uh, responsible way or a, a God-honoring way. You don't, don't feel guilty because you live in America. Don't feel guilty because you own more than one car. Don't feel guilty because your room's full of clothes or shoes or whatever. Don't feel guilty about that. But you do have a responsibility before God to use whatever that wealth is, however much you got, 
to live a, a, a God-honoring life, okay? Now, in our text, James is going to give us a, a four or a number of uh, common abuses of wealth or money or whatever, so let, let, let's read this, okay? You need to buckle your seatbelt, okay? This is brutal. <laughs> this is just a brutal section of Scripture. Here we go, James chapter 1, or James chapter 5, verse 1. Now listen, you rich people. By the world's standards, okay. Now listen, you rich people, weep and wail because of the misery that's coming upon you. Your wealth has rotted, and moths have eaten your clothes. Your gold and silver are corroded. Their corrosion will testify against you and eat your flesh like fire. Ooh. You have hoarded wealth in these last days. Look, the wages you failed to pay the workmen who mowed your fields are crying out against you. The cries of the harvesters have reached the ears of the Lord Almighty. You have lived on earth in luxury and self-indulgence. You have fattened yourselves in the day of slaughter. You have condemned and murdered innocent men who are not opposing you. That's an uplifting section of scripture, isn't it? Let's all, let's all read that again. Go home, have dinner. <laughs> now some of you are thinking, what does that have to do with anything? What's all, I've been reading the Bible for years, I never read that. Your subconscious just kind of suppressed it as you read it. The Bible says this in 2 Timothy chapter 3, all scripture, which includes what I just read, all scripture is inspired by God. That wasn't James just saying, I got nothing to do. Let me write something down. No, the Holy Spirit filled James. And those are the very words that, J that God wanted us to all know. All Scripture is inspired by God, and it's useful to teach us what is true and to make us realize what is wrong in our lives. It corrects us when we're wrong, and it teaches us to do what is right. God uses it. God uses the Word. God uses those very words of James to prepare and equip his people to do every good work. So because this section of James chapter 5 is a part of the scriptures, there's something in it that we can all learn from. In other words, God's, God's going to somehow use it today, I, I believe, in, in your life, just as he used it this past week in my own personal life. Now you need to remember a few things here, okay? Number one, you need to remember that, that James, in this little section here that I read, was writing to believers, this was written to, to us, those of us that name the name of, of Christ. He's writing to Christians, and, and not just Christians in general, but this little section here was actually written to the wealthy Christians, which means most of us in this room. That's who it was written to. Now let me quickly say this. In New Testament times, there really wasn't what we would call a, a middle class. You were either super rich or you were really poor. And the rich, even the Christians that were rich, tended to manipulate or oppress or even abuse the, the poor in some really horrible ways. Okay? And in this text, James lashes out and he rebukes the Christians who were using their wealth in, in crummy ways or in really non-Christian ways. Okay? And... Um, this might be, some theologians say, this is probably one of the most negative sections in all of the New Testament. James uses some pretty harsh words here, okay? He's, he's basically condemning a group of people who claim to know, you know, know, know the Lord. Now, we may not commit these sins to the same degree, but this passage is a, you know, gives us some healthy warnings that we need to make, make sure we as Christians aren't, aren't kind of fumbling on. So let, let, let me walk through a few of them with you, just real quick, so, real quick, okay? Number one, <laughs> it's bad to hoard your money. I just, I don't need to get fancy here. Verse two says, your wealth has rotted and moths have, have eaten your clothes, gold and your silver is corroded. You have hoarded wealth in these last days, okay? The first 
thing I just want to share, for, you know, to you is that look, it, it's bad to hoard your wealth. It's bad to hoard your money. It's bad to hoard your money. Now, James isn't talking about savings here. Because the Bible encourages you to save. I'm going to talk about more of that in just a minute. You see, in the New Testament times, you could hoard your wealth in basically three ways. Number one, you could stockpile food. You could hoard food. Number two, you could stockpile clothes. You could hoard your clothes. Or you could stockpile precious metals, jewels, those kinds of things. And this is also the way that wealthy people could show off their wealth and the New Testament times. I mean, if you had a bunch of money, you'd show it off by having a lot of food around your house or by wearing all kinds of different clothes each day or by wearing all kinds of fancy jewelry each and every day. Okay, that was how a wealthy person would let you know they were wealthy. They had a lot of food in their home. They had all these nice clothes they were wearing around. They had all kinds of jewels that they were wearing around, gold bracelets, those kinds of things. And what James is saying here is really interesting. He begins by saying, your wealth has rotted. Your wealth has rotted. Now, how does wealth rot? Well, it rots in the form of food. James is saying is that your, your food has gone rotten. Now, which food tends to go rotten? The food that you eat every day? No. The food you eat every day, you eat every day. It's gone. The food that rots is the stuff you got piled up in your refrigerator out in your garage. Not the one in your house, or the stuff you got piled up inside your refrigerator. It's just been sitting there for weeks and weeks and months and months. That's the food that rots. The stuff that's hoarded, that you never use. Man, when I was single, I created new life forms in my, in my refrigerator. Man, I'd open it up, man, and things would just move. <laughs> Gee, time, to, time to throw that out. I don't know what it is. I think it's penicillin in, in its raw form. Then James says, moths have eaten your clothes. Now, once again, which clothes tend to get moth-eaten? The ones you wear all the time? No. You're pulling those in and out, wearing them, doing stuff, sending them to the cleaners. It's the stuff you got stockpiled that you've hoarded in your closet that you never take out, that you never wear. Those are the ones that tend to get moth-eaten. And then last but not least, James says, your gold and silver are corroded. Now, usually the, the jewelry you wear all the time, what do you do? You take it to your favorite jeweler, and what do they do? They clean it up for you, right? Because you're wearing it all the time. You take your necklaces that you wear all the time, and they, they put it in that cleaner, and it gets it all clean. You have your rings all polished, the ones you wear all the time. Which jewelry tends to get corroded? The ones you've got hoarded in boxes that you've never used. You got a chain, you got something a long, long time ago. You never use the thing. It's just sitting in a box somewhere. Not doing anybody any good. You're never going to wear the thing again. But you got 12 chains, right? This is some serious business here that God's talking about. I mean, really serious stuff. Some of you are going, I guess I am wealthy. Look, I, I, look um, God doesn't give you, you know, money or wealth so that you can go out and simply buy stuff. He doesn't give you money so you can just make sure you've got so much food in your refrigerator, you, you never use it, and things just rot. He doesn't give you wealth and, you know, the money that you have so you can just... Oh, man, I bought so much cheese, you know. I had to throw out a whole pack of it because it's green. The moss is growing on it, or moss, whatever that stuff is. It's growing all over it, fungus or whatever. I don't know. It, does it? Or, you know, you had so much meat packed in your freezer, and, man, you opened up a T-bone, it was all freezer burned because you just didn't get to it in time.
See, he gives you the wealth that you have, the money that you have for greater purposes. Now our flesh, man, it's, it's strong. Really strong. It just dominates us. Just dominates us. And the power of God in you somehow gets snuffed out. Your flesh loves to be stroked. It loves to be patted on the back. Your flesh loves phrases like, man, you look good. Hey, you're looking good, man. Yeah. <laughs> I do look good, don't I? We love, we love that phrase. And we love it when people say it to us. You look good. Hey, you're looking good. You're looking good. I, I'm not really sure believers ought to say that to each other. Because that goes one place, the flesh. That's where it goes. So we're buying clothes, we're buying jewelry, we're doing all this stuff so that we, we look good. God doesn't care whether you look good or not. He's not interested in how good you look. He cares about how good you act. He cares deeply about your conduct. How you live, not how good you look. By the way, you're all looking good. <laughs> Went to feel better about yourself after this text. <laughs> it gives us pretty strong warning in verse three. Their corrosion, the corrosion of stockpiled gold or silver, will testify against you and eat your flesh like fire. Remember, James didn't write this. The Holy Spirit filled him. God's got some pretty weighty stuff here to say to most of us in this room. I would say about 99.99% of us in this room. You've hoarded wealth in these last days. You lived on earth in luxury and self-indulgence. You fattened yourselves in the day of slaughter. Oh, this is some weighty stuff here. Number two, it's bad to steal to gain your money or your wealth. Look, James says, the wages you failed to pay the workmen who mowed your fields, crying out against you, the, the, the cries of the harvesters have reached the ears of the Lord Almighty. Which, by the way, let me go back to something here. No, I'm not. I'm not going to do it. I'll never get through this. I got a lot of, I got a lot of things here. The, 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 I'll tell you, the, this, is, this, is, this is an important message. Not very many preachers are going to preach through James chapter 5, verses 1 through 5 here. You got to underline that little phrase, failed to pay. See that right there? It's amazing to me that over 2,000 years have gone by since this was written, and very little has changed because it goes on today. And you might be thinking, how... Well, in our county, Stanislaus County, uh, we have a lot of people that come here that work that are undocumented. Okay, they're here illegally. And oftentimes, at the end of the day, they aren't paid what they're told they were going to be paid. They're ripped off. And because they're here illegally, they're undocumented, but they don't have much recourse. What are they going to go do? Call the police? And so the guy that owns the field, the guy that owns the farm, just got a little bit wealthier, didn't he? Because he didn't pay the worker what he said he was going to pay that worker. Happens all the time. Right here in Modesto. 2,000 years after this was written. Same kind of shenanigans go on today. I'll tell you another way, you, you, can, you can steal to get a little more wealthy. You work at a business... And you got kids, and they need pencils and paper and all that kind of stuff for homework. And, and so you go into the, you know, the, the closet there at work, and you grab a couple packs of pencils and some yellow pads of paper, and you walk out. That would cost you about 12 bucks or so at a store, but you didn't have to pay. Guess what? You just got a little bit wealthier by stealing stuff from your employer. 
You just put 12 bucks in your pocket. You just, you just made 12 bucks, and it wasn't your money to make. It belonged to your employer. And your employer may never see it. May never see you walk out with the pencils or the paper or the sticky notes or whatever it is. But it, they're not the ones you ought to worry about. Because the Lord sees it. And he doesn't want you to get wealthy. He doesn't want you to make money by stealing, by ripping somebody off. You're not paying them what they're supposed to be paid. Or by stealing from your employer so that you don't have to spend the money. God doesn't want you to do that. Some of you might think it's trivial. Well, people shouldn't be here illegally. You're right. I'm not trying to make a political statement here. I, I, I'm, I'm not. I don't think people should be here illegally. I think people should go through and do the law thing. I, I, but, but you also shouldn't rip people off. Don't walk out of here thinking I'm making some political statement. I'm not. I'm all for securing the borders and making sure people are here legally. Don't misunderstand what I'm saying. I just know that people that are made in God's very image come here. And they work here in our fields and in our, our, our farms and they do all this stuff and it's really easy to rip them off and pad the bottom line. And it happens all the, all, all the, all the time. The Bible says, the wages you failed to pay the workmen who mowed your field are crying out against you. God sees it. Uh, n- num- number three. It's bad to waste your money. Okay, just, just bad. Verse five says you have lived on earth in luxury and self-indulgence. Okay, this is about how we might spend our money or the wealth that God gives us. You see, one of the greatest temptations we all face is this. The more money you make, the more you're tempted to spend it on selfish stuff. In other words, the more money you make, it easy, the easier it is to waste it. You tend to say things like this with the more money you have. Or at least I do. Let me, let me, just, let me just use me. I can afford it. So why not buy it? I deserve it. So why not buy it? Hey, man, I've worked here 30 years, man. I was a youth guy here for a long time, low guy on totem pole, which means low paycheck on totem pole. I deserve it. I deserve to do that. Or I'm worth it. So why not buy it? I mean, I'm worth it. Come on. Listen, just because you can afford something doesn't mean you ought to buy it. Now, if you're, my goal wouldn't make anybody feel guilty. That's not, that's not the point here. Maybe, maybe the Holy Spirit's doing something in your life. That might be true. I don't know. I'm just, I'm just throwing out some principles from the Word of God, and whatever the Holy Spirit does with those things, the Holy Spirit does them. I got my own. I got, a, I got my own thing I got to deal with with the Holy Spirit. Trust me, I hear from the Lord. For Christians, you know, Christmas is one of the most holiest seasons of the year, but instead of focusing on what's really important, you know, we just make it the consumer event of the year. And, and we've really, I've watched you as a church family really take some strides to make that a, a holier time with some of the, the three gifts and just some of those kinds of things. So, James says, don't hoard your wealth, don't steal to gain your wealth, don't use your wealth, uh, don't waste your wealth. Number four. It's bad to abuse the power of your money. This one's big. He says in verse 6, remember he's talking to wealthy people, you you have condemned and murdered innocent men who weren't even opposing you. Well, but this is about influence. You see, some of the people who were rich and wealthy at this time were literally ruining the lives of innocent poor people. And in some cases, they were actually involved in killing them. And because these people were poor, they were powerless to do anything about it. 
And so God's Holy Spirit fills James and says, James, you pin these words and you get these words out to my people. Because my people shouldn't be acting like this. My people are too worried about how good they look. And I'm glad we comb our hairs and do all that kind of stuff. And they're not worried enough about how good they're acting. And what their conduct is. So you write this, James. It ain't right. You see, money gives you influence. It gives you the opportunity to manipulate others. I, I've known families where one person to keep their relatives under control by threatening to cut them out of the will. You don't do what I say. You're, you're gone. Okay. We keep our kids under control by bribing them, right, with our allowances. Hey. Right? I, I, I do it. I met. Money has a lot more power than simply buying power. It gives you influence. And one of the areas we see this happen a lot is in the world of politics. People of wealth, they got access that I don't have. Have you, have you noticed that? You can write a big check with lots of commas. You get to meet People shake hands with people who write laws that impact your life. Isn't that weird? <laughs> you know, we got a war going on in Afghanistan, and next thing you know, George Clooney is talking to the Senate Foreign Relations Committee. Does anybody care what George Clooney thinks about what's happening? in Afghanistan? Does anybody care what Angelina Jolene thinks about anything, really? I don't! <laughs> but man, they got money. I guarantee you nobody in this room is going to get a call. Would you come and share your thoughts and your opinions on what we're doing in Afghanistan? And you know why? You don't have the kind of money that they've got. Like George Clooney has a clue about what's happening in Afghanistan. Maybe he does, but he hasn't got any more of a clue than I do. And that ain't much. I know there's a war going on over there and hope our guys are safe. But watch the wealthy people. They get to go before Congress and why? Because they're wealthy. They got money and you don't have it. Not like they do. It's unbelievable. The, the media falls all over themselves to interview uh, Brad Pitt about, hey, what do you think about starvation in Mongolia? <laughs> and we all just sit at our TV riveted. Oh, that's a great idea. That guy's brilliant. Listen, godly people, listen to me, godly people recognize that money or wealth gives them a, a degree of influence, and they use that influence for the kingdom's sake. That's what they do. For the kingdom's sake. Look, the, 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 the point that James is making in this passage is that we ought to use our, our affluence for good influence. Does that make sense? I mean, that makes sense, right? Now, once again, the consequences of misusing your money are pretty, pretty weighty. Look again at verse 5. You have fattened yourselves in the day of slaughter. You see, I was going to come at this passage from a whole other angle. But I kept coming back to these great warnings from God. And I thought, no, no. This is serious to God. And if I, don't, if I don't try to bore down into our flesh here, then I'm, I'm doing you a disservice, Christian. I know some of you are really uncomfortable. I know it. I was uncomfortable reading it.
You see, you can get away with a, a lot of evil things down here on planet Earth, but God sees it all, and someday he's going to take action. Dr. Jeremiah said this, God shows us what's at the end of the road so that we don't ever get on the road. See? That's a great, great quote. So those are the don'ts. Let me, let me give you some do's. These are the right things to do with, with, with your money, okay? Number one, it, it's good to work hard for your money. That's a, that's a good thing. Proverbs chapter 13 says, uh, wealth from get-rich schemes quickly disappear. Wealth from hard work grows over time. That's the truth, isn't it? One version says, dishonest money dwindles away, but he who gathers money little by little makes it grow. In other words, man, there, there's something about working hard, getting up early, going to work, trying to get a few extra hours in, you know? Nothing wrong with that. Proverbs 14 says, all hard work brings a, 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 a profit, but mere talk leads only to poverty. A lot of people out there love to talk about something. I gotta do this. I got this plan. I'm gonna do this. I got this plan. I got this plan. I got this. I'm gonna do this. Dude, look, man, quit talking. Go ahead. And, Taco Bell needs somebody. Taco Bell's hiring. You've been talking and talking and talking and haven't done a thing. I don't care about all your fancy dreams and all the great things you're going to invent over the... Go, Taco Bell, go make a burrito. <laughs> and you work hard, and then when you're off work, you can dream all you want and talk all you want and, 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 and all that. But go, go, go work hard. That, that's what Proverbs is saying. That's all. Oh, you know, I, got my, I got my master's degree. Let me give you three important things, or principles, if you will, about making money. A, okay, so you, you, this is good. Make as much money as you want, as long as it doesn't hurt your own health. God, God doesn't care. God doesn't care how much money you make. Make a ton of money, as long as you don't goof up your own health. Proverbs 23 says, do, do not wear yourself out to get rich. Have the wisdom to show restraint. God doesn't care whether you work hard and work hard and make some money here. And make some, God doesn't have a problem with that. What he does have a problem with is if, if, if you're working and working and working to the detriment of your own health. I know some people that have literally worked themselves to death, right? God doesn't care that you make money. He doesn't care that you make a lot of money. Work hard. Make all the money you want. Just don't do it that in a way that goofs up you know, your, your, your own health. People work so hard and they have a massive heart attack because they've been working so hard, you know. Health always takes priority over wealth. B or two, make, make as much money as you want as long as it doesn't hurt your family. Make money. Go to work. Do it all. I don't care. But once it starts to impact your family, you know, all of a sudden, Dad, or, you know, you come home and your kid goes, who are you? <laughs> I'm your father. <laughs> really? I haven't seen you in a while. Well, the reason why you haven't seen me, son, is because I'm out working hard to make a lot of money for you. No. That's not how it works. Sounds logical. Kind of makes you feel good about yourself. Remember your flesh? Remember I said how powerful it is? The reality is, God doesn't care whether you, how much money you make. Make a lot of money. Just make sure you don't do it at the, to, to the detriment of your own health or to the detriment of your family. God gave you a family. He gave you a wife. He gave you a husband. He gave you kids, whatever it might be. And he didn't honor your life with those things so that you could blow them off to go make more money. And number three, or or C or whatever, make as much money as you want as long as you keep your spiritual life on the same level. Listen to this interesting thought here from our brother John. He said this, Beloved, I pray that you may prosper in all things and be in good health just as your soul prospers. In other words, look, work, do whatever you want to do, but don't, don't forget about your soul. You see, I know a lot of people, man, 
they're working and working and they got you know a lot of dough and a lot of cars and homes and all that and they're beautiful people and they look good and they got all this but their soul is dead they got a dead soul and god says work hard make money but put as much juice in to your soul see keep your soul fit as as, as good as you'll you know everything else don't, don't forget about that So it's, it's good to work hard for your money. N- n- number two, it's, it's good to save some of your money. This is a good thing. It's good to save some of your money. So you work hard for it. It's good to save it. Proverbs 21 says, In the house of the wise are stores of choice food and oil, but a foolish man devours all that he has. And so in other words, you, you know, back in those days when that was written, you would make sure that you, you had some food saved because, you know, um, it could be a long week, might be a long winter, something like that. And so you want to make sure that you have something saved for those crazy moments. Not the foolish guy. The foolish guy doesn't care about saving any of that stuff. He just eats it all, drinks it all, consumes it all. The Living Bible says, The wise man saves for the future, but the foolish man spends whatever he gets. I read an article last week or that Ben Stein had written a long, long time ago where he talks about how little we as Americans save. He said this, quote, the average Chinese worker with the average wages uh, 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 roughly one twentieth of, a, of an American wage and saves 40% of his or her pay to prepare for retirement. The average American saves less than 0%. The average American. Now, some of you probably save a lot, but the average American doesn't really save anything. They just consume their entire paycheck, in other words. Now, 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 now here, here's the deal. Why do Americans save so little? Well, I think there's lots of reasons, but one of the main reasons is, is that we as Americans have little or no self-control. We can't control ourselves. Our flesh... American Christians, their flesh is dominating them. It dominates them. The power of God within them isn't making any difference. Oh, they're saved. But the old man, the earth suit that we have, no good dwells in this. It dominates the American Christian. It's one of the reasons why the American Christian is having such a, 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 a limited uh, impact on our culture today because the flesh has just got the better of us. And we don't, we don't think biblically. We care more about other things than am I somehow living out God's plan or purpose for my life. Proverbs chapter 30 says, Four things on earth are small, yet they are extremely wise. Ants are creatures of little strength, yet they store up their food in the summer. Ants save, in other words. Little, little, little brain. Little is brain. The little is tiniest brain you could ever see. Little thing. It saves, and it has a little tiny brain. (laughs) Isn't that bizarre? God's word is just so incredibly convicting at times. Now here, what's the purpose of, of, of saving? Here, here's where the Bible differs from the world's thinking in a major way. Okay? The world thinks that you save money for security. In other words, uh, if you accumulate a, a big enough bank account, you'll, you'll be secure. And I want you to know that's faulty thinking. That's unbiblical thinking. That's worldly thinking. That's thinking that appeals to the flesh. 
That doesn't bore down into the Holy Spirit within you. Look, um, the reason why it's faulty thinking is because no matter how much you got, you could lose it instantly. Just ask those that had a whole big bank account. Worldcom. Poof. Enron. Poof. Bernie Madoff. Poof. God, some of you were probably impacted by that. People who thought the retirement was secure. I got all the money I need. I'm a month away, man. I've been pushing this broom for 30 years, man. And I've stored up a war chest. Boom, gone, nothing. Could happen to you. Could happen to me. Beloved, your money can be taken away from you in a nanosecond. Your family can be taken away from you in a nanosecond. Your reputation can be taken away from you, 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 you know, from you in a nanosecond. Pick something. There's only one thing that can't be taken away from you, and that's your relationship to Jesus Christ. It's the only real secure thing in life. The Bible says this in Philippians chapter 4, and my God will meet all of your needs according to his glorious riches in Christ Jesus. Now, now that security... God wants you to trust that he'll take care of you. Now remember, I didn't say you shouldn't save. I started the whole thing off by talking about savings. But you've got to have a different mindset every time you put some money away in your bank or 401k or 403b or whatever. So why do we save? Why, why do we as Christians save? Well, let me give you two things real, real quick. Number one, it prevents you from in, impulse buying. If all of a sudden you go, hey, here's what my paycheck is, and I, got, I get X amount, I'm going to take this, and I'm going to put it in my savings account, and I'm not touching it. Because, as I've already said, our flesh, when you got it, you want to spend it. And where do you think that old saying came? Boy, that money's what? Burning a hole in your pocket. In a biblical sense, it's your flesh. You got no control, no self-control. And so you, you, you buy clothes you don't need, and you got it all hoarded in your closet. You buy food you really don't need, it's all hoarded in your, in your, your refrigerator. You're buying jewelry that you really don't need. I got seven chains, but I got a new one. You, you just, we just can't help ourselves. And I'm talking to me too, family. Please don't. Well, this guy's really getting on me. Maybe I am. I just know I was getting on me this week. And the second thing it does, it allows you to help other people when they have a need. That's why you put some money away. So that when a brother or a sister or something happens in their life or a family member, guess what? You, you put something away where you can say, let me be a blessing to you. Let me, let me help you out here. How can, I, how, can I, how can I help you here? Let me help you there. We, we have these principles here at our church. We put some money away. That's why we can help so many people here at this church. And we do our due diligence. We just don't hand money out. We just don't hand things out. We've done our due diligence, and we make sure that there's accountability and all that, all that kind of stuff. N n number three, real, real quick here. It's good to spend your money wisely. See, I'm not a bad guy. <laughs> I like to spend money. I don't put all this time and energy in and get that little rectangle and not spend any of it. But it's good to spend your money wisely. And I have you writing that word down, wisely. The plans of, a hard, of, of hardworking people earn a profit, but those who act too quickly become poor. And it'd be way too convicting for anybody to say amen. <laughs> oh, boy. Don't let anybody tell you, ah, book's old. It's outdated. There's nothing, there's nothing in that thing that can really help my life today. They're wrong. This is so applicable today, it's unbelievable. You see, it's way easier to get into debt than it is to get out of debt. Right? So we 
need to spend our money wisely. We've all heard those, you know, car dealership commercials. You know, you can buy now, pay later kind of a thing. Only 36 easy payments. <laughs> I've told you many, many times, I I've never made an easy payment. <laughs> Has anybody? <laughs> hey, hey, honey, it's only 36 easy payments. They're easy. What's the problem? The guy just said it's easy. Hey, yeah. And then so you got those 36 e easy payments, and then you got roped into the sham wow. And that, now, you got that, that, now you got that payment, and that was something you need. They, th those are called old rags. <laughs> They're free. You got a whole pile of them in your house, right? Yeah. Why did I buy that sham wow? That didn't make any sense. You're right, you acted too quickly. And there was a little bit less money you had in your bank account. But now you got those sham wells sitting in a closet somewhere. You don't even use them, do you? You don't. So how do you spell relief? It's called a budget. You've got to sit down and make a budget. It's one of the great ministries we have here at this church is we have um, uh, our crown ministries. We call it compass ministries now. And one of the things I dig is those classes are always full, and I dig it. Because that means people are really starting to get a handle on, on their finances. It's, a, it's biblical budgeting. And by the way, as I said, nothing wrong with working hard to make money. But you make some of the money, put some of it away, and then spend, spend some of it wisely. God doesn't care whether you're spending money. Nothing wrong with that. And number four, it's good to give away some of your money generously. That's a good thing. Proverbs 11 says, give freely and become more wealthy. Be stingy and lose everything. The generous will prosper. Those who refresh others will, will themselves be refreshed. Now, it doesn't say anything about amounts there. It doesn't say anything about that. It's not about an amount. It's simply about being generous. Giving some of your wealth away. Giving some of your money away. I think it's one of the beautiful um, disciplines that we have here every weekend where we say, hey, are you ready to give to the Lord? Being generous with what you, with what you make. And let, let, let me give you just three things real quick that, that happen when, when, when you're generous. Number one, when, when you give, it, it makes you more like God. The Bible says in John chapter 3, for God so loved the world that he, he gave, he gave, he wrote a check, so to speak. The difference is he didn't write a check. He gave his son. So it's obvious God's a giver and a, and a generous one. Now if that passage would have said, for God so loved the world, man, that he gave his, his goldfish, man. Well, I'd still be happy. Or man, he, he, he loved you and he gave you a, a porcupine. He sent a porcupine here for you. A porcupine. Well, that's cool. He's God. He, he didn't send you a porcupine. He gave his son. Ephesians chapter 5 says, Be imitators of God, therefore, as dearly beloved children, and live a life of love just as Christ loved us, and he gave himself up for us as a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. Look, when you give, when you're generous with your wealth, it makes you more like God. Number two, when you give, it breaks the sin of materialism in your life. That bond, that, this bondage that we're all in at times. Our flesh gets the better of us. Man, I, I, I need to buy something. But the church is going to ask me in about a month maybe to give over and above what I normally give. Ooh. Wow. Our flesh doesn't like that. The one moment in, in, in church, you know, when I know people get upset is when I talk about finances. Preacher's talking about money again. That's your flesh talking. That's not your spirit talking. That's your flesh. Remember, I've already told you 20 times tonight. Your, your, your flesh is strong. 
Now you come here and you can sit here and sing all the songs and listen to all the messages. As long as you just don't do it, the flesh is happy. The flesh doesn't want you to be like God. And so when you do give, that bondage of materialism is broken to a degree when, when, when you give. And number three, when you give, it reminds you to keep God first in, in your life. That's what it does. I was thinking about those families. And some of you, most of you, in here would go, man, if I had $100,000, man, imagine what you could do with $100,000. So one family's done it for five years. That's, that's a half a million dollars. Imagine what you could do with a half a million. Well, whatever it is you can dream of, they, they, they could dream of it. And trust me, they, these, are, these are generous people. They didn't have to do that. This is over and above what they give. But they know, you know what, it makes me more like God. And they have desires. Their flesh is pretty strong, too. It helps break the, the bondage of materialism in their life. And it reminds them, let's just keep God first in our lives. It's probably one of the reasons why, I don't know, God blesses them. So here's the deal. Let, let me just end with this. Um, it's just four questions. H have you been saving your money faithfully? You've been making your money honestly. You've been spending your money wisely. You've been generous with the money that you, you, you do have. And those are some questions that maybe in your small group you can wrestle around with. Or you can wrestle around with them maybe as a, as a single person. Or as a college student. Or as a husband and wife. And you know maybe you'd say, you know what? I really haven't been working hard. I need to get out there and beat the bushes a little bit more. I need to get myself a job. You know, we don't, we don't want to save anything. Well, we, can, we can put something away, can't we? Hey, let's look at what we do spend our money at. My, my friend Jeff Sutton sitting right down here. The guy is unbelievable. We always go on vacation together. And we spend a, at least a week together on vacation. And he, he has this little card and on it, he has everything budgeted out. He knows exactly how much money that they can spend on little, whatever the little things are that we do on vacations. He knows. Now, that doesn't mean he, he doesn't break the rule every now and then. You ever heard that thing called an exception to the rule? There's no such thing as an exception to the rule if you got no rule. <laughs> it's just called chaos. See, but when you have some rules, when you set up a budget and you really think it all through, hey, a budget isn't scripture, but at least you have what you have something. And it helps you to spend your money wisely. See. Or maybe the thing you ought to discuss is, you know, are we being generous with what we do have? And once again, it's not about how much. Are we being generous, or are we just kind of hoarding it all to, to ourselves? Everybody stand up. Over in the venue, everybody stand, and I'll turn that over to you, uh, Joel, over there. Father, thanks, Lord, for um, tonight, and I sure hope, Lord, that everybody in here knows I, I care about them, and I wasn't trying to be mean, or I just loved them enough, Lord, to read your word and do my best to unfold it. And God, I would hope that it would help us all to have a better grip on our money, our wealth, our finances, or whatever. Thanks, Jesus, for your goodness to us. And um, I pray these things in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and all the God's people said, amen. amen.